in today's tutorial, we're probably gonna we're gonna try go over some of the um, basics of cameras. So um, how to move cameras, or sorry, how to animate cameras, so how to make moving cameras. Um, so that will kind of be a basic look at the introduction of um, like the timeline. So understanding the animation timeline, which in effect is just the sort of basic um, understanding or the fundamentals of animation just in general. So there will be some sort of like beginner knowledge that hopefully um, we can go through today. And then towards the sort of end, it will kind of ramp a little bit in difficulty, maybe towards some intermediate um, sort of stuff. So I would say uh, if you're like completely new, I did I didn't catch the uh, I didn't catch the one through tens that everyone did. But if you're completely new to Blender, this might be a little bit um, unfamiliar. I, I would say that this maybe needs a little bit of familiarity with the interface, you know, some knowledge of kind of basic scene setup and things like that. Um, you know, adding basic things like a camera or a light. But you know, in any case, this is recorded, so you can you can kind of come back uh, like any time, really. So we're going to go over, depending on how much time we get. I'm sorry we started a little bit late. Um, that's my bad, but we've got about 50 minutes or so, so we might not get all the way to the end of some of the stuff that I planned at the, at the very end, but um, we'll be going through um, probably the basics of cameras, so how to animate and move cameras, and then the initial foundation of knowledge to animate anything in Blender, really. Um, we'll be setting up a couple of different cameras, so I've got a thing kind of playing on the screen at the moment. Uh, if I just go to the basic kind of, um, uh, not wireframe, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of clay render or workspace render, you can probably see the movements a little bit more clearly. So we're going to go through some basics, how to kind of like set up a couple of different cameras in the sort of scene that you see here, different movements, learning how to kind of switch uh, automatically between cameras in um, a single blender scene, um, you know, a couple of different ways maybe of how to kind of control those cameras and in, in kind of um, in a few different ways for some different techniques. Uh, and then if we get to time towards the end, um, you know, a little, maybe a little look into like a slightly more intermediate section of like how to animate a camera kind of along a path and how to track objects with a camera and things like that. So. Hopefully that sort of makes sense as like a broad overview. Um, don't worry if you don't know some of the terms that uh, happened along the way, we'll go through them in, in this tutorial. But if you have any questions uh, as we go along, uh, I'll try and answer them. Uh, if I if I don't know the answer immediately, just maybe DM me, I'll, tr I'll try to find the answer for you. Um, I'll try and remember uh, to call out all the shortcuts as I go along, but if I miss something, just drop a message and I'll and go back. Uh, hopefully someone can kind of uh, look after the uh, B stage chat for me just in case anyone gets lost. And uh, finally, I also live like on a main road. So I'm sorry if you hear the uh, the police rolling by in uh, East London. So with all that said, um, we'll get cracking. So I'm going to pause this for a second and I'm going to start a completely uh, new file. So a completely blank file. And I'll just delete everything out of that file anyway. So we're all starting from the same uh, start point. Uh, you won't be able to see this, I think, uh, depending on my recording setups or the live stream setups, but I'm just going to import my um, GLB file of my beast. So anyone, you don't need a T-pose to, uh, to do this in any way. Um, we can just use the standard uh, GLB file from from AKCB, and uh, I'll just tidy up the. So let me just expand a couple of these, a couple of these windows, just so everyone, everyone can see things a little bit better. I'm uh, just going to tidy up the uh, the outliner. So the outliner is the thing in the top right. So that's basically the list of uh, all the things that are in your scene. So I'm just going to select uh, all of the parts of my model, I'm going to press M, so M to move, add them to a new collection, I'm just going to call this lost, and that will move, there's a couple of stragglers left over, but um, that will move most of the 
uh, most of the parts like into that into that folder just to keep things nice and tidy. I've got a few empty objects here which are causing me some issues. Um, anyway, okay, so we got lost in a folder. I'm just going to set up a basic scene um, so we've kind of got something to um, kind of animate within. So I'm just going to add, so Shift A, Shift A brings up the add menu. So I'm just going to add a mesh. I'm going to add a plane as usual. I'm going to press S. So S to scale, scale the plane, bring it out kind of a uh, fairly large distance. Um, I'm going to tab into edit mode. So I'm just going to create a little basic backdrop ramp. Uh, if you followed along with any of the other ones or any of the other tutorials, we're just going to uh, almost do exactly the same setup as some of those. So I'm going to create a little bit of a backdrop ramp. So uh, tab into edit mode. You'll know when you're in edit mode because you'll see um, all the vertices of the mesh. Um, you can press one, two, and three. So the numbers one, two, and three to cycle through vertex selection. So the ability to select points. Two for edge selection to select edges. Three to select bases. So I want the edge selection for this one. So I'm just going to press two. I'm going to select this back edge. I'm going to press E. So E to extrude. Z, Z, depending on where you are in the world, to extrude that upwards in the Z axis just to create a kind of back wall. So if you imagine that I am the camera, I'm looking this way, so he's got a bit of a wall. Then I'm going to stay in edit mode. I'm going to uh, select this corner edge. I'm going to press Control and B. So Control B to bevel. And if you drag your mouse, depending on where your mouse is on the screen, it will. you might not see anything initially, but if you move your mouse either left or right, you'll see a kind of chamfer or a bevel appear on the edge. And if you scroll up on your mouse wheel, it will start adding in loop cuts. Um, and we don't need loads. Maybe we only need three or four. Just something to give us a nice curve. So I'll tab back out of edit mode, back into object mode. And then I will select this uh, backdrop ramp, right click, shade smooth. So now we've got a just a basic um, almost like a backdrop ramp, as you would have if you were taking a photograph of something or whatever it might be. So cool, we've got this backdrop ramp and I'll just name this in the outliner. It's always good to keep uh, keep an eye on um, the organization of the outliner in the top right, just so you can find things easily. So backdrop ramp. Uh, now I'm just gonna add in a, a basic light so I deleted everything out of the scene uh, initially, but if you didn't do that and you um, only deleted the cube, you'll already have a light and you'll already have a camera. But just for the sake of kind of uh, continuity and simplicity, I'll add a camera in and a light in myself. So Shift A to bring up the add menu uh, and then scroll down about just under halfway to light. And it doesn't really matter what light, uh, light you add. I'm just gonna add in a point light uh, just because it's probably the simplest to kind of set up and it will add it in in our case at the center of the scene so if you've done nothing if you change nothing about the scene you'll likely have your 3d cursor which is this kind of um, red spherical object with the axes in it set up in the middle so it will always add um, you will always add an object to wherever the 3d cursor is so for example if i move my 3d cursor by pressing shift and then right click. So you can see this little orb is somewhere over on the left hand side. It can be over on the right hand side, wherever you click. If I then add an object, so let's just say shift A and then add a cube, it will add that object wherever the 3D cursor is in the scene. So this is helpful if you want to kind of, I don't know, say you're modeling a hat or something. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, I suppose, from the actual tutorial, but say you're modeling a a hat or whatever, you know, you can just uh, shift click, you know, onto my guy's head and that will bring the 3D cursor kind of like super close to the to the head. And then I could just shift A and add the cube and it will add the cube more or less about where you need it for a hat. Obviously, this looks nothing like a hat, but you get the idea. Um, so shift selecting or right shift and then right click, right clicking and then adding to wherever the 3D cursor is, is a super handy way of 
um, not having to like maybe move the object loads, you know, say it creates over here somewhere and then you have to spend ages kind of aligning it in the, uh, in the viewport or whatever it might be. Just helps you save a little bit of time and it all adds up. Um, so I don't actually need this cube. Um, <laughs> so I'll just undo. Maybe I'll uh, just delete the cube. So X and then delete. Or you can just use the delete. The delete key. So I'm going to go back to my original point, <laughs> which was the point light. So I'm just going to make sure I have that selected over here in the outliner. And I'm just going to press G to move it around. I'm going to just flick into um, into uh, viewport shading. So I can just see a little bit better what's going on with this light. So I've added in this point light. Let me just drag this not so if you want to control your light you come down here over on the right hand side all the way down to the little uh, data um, the object data properties of this light that I have selected which is the little light bulb which is handy I'm just going to turn the power up to I don't know maybe a thousand maybe that's a bit far 500 or so and I'm just going to position this in a way that kind of illuminates my beast um, in a fairly easy to understand manner um, I'm not going to be specific about, uh, you know, rendering in cycles or EV in, in this tutorial. I'll probably leave it in EV because it will make my playback faster uh, in terms of the viewport. Sorry if you hear the police in the background, um, but I'm just going to leave it in EV for now, uh, just because the focus of this tutorial is going to be on animated cameras. So we want to make sure we can kind of see smooth movements. But, you know, all of this works in cycles and you could go into cycles for a slightly better um, shading result, I guess. Well, I'll leave it in now. So I've got the got the light, added it into the position so I can see my see my character. And now we're at the point where we're just going to add our first camera. Again, if you've got um, if you've not deleted everything out of your scene when you created the new file, you'll already have a camera. But since I deleted everything, I no longer have a camera. So I'm going to Shift A to bring up the Add menu. I'm uh, going to go down almost three from the bottom to, towards camera and add a camera to the scene. Uh, and you'll see, actually, this is a good example, since my 3D cursor was all the way over here on the left hand side from when I added in the cube, uh, it's added the camera uh, onto that 3D cursor. So um, sometimes it's good to pay attention to where that 3D cursor lies because, um, I don't know, say you click all the way over here for some reason and then you're like, I've added a camera, but you know, where did it go? Occasionally, it's exactly where it was supposed to go, which is by a 3D cursor. So I'm just going to make sure I have that camera selected. And I'm just going to drag it over so G to grab it. And I'm just going to pan around my character, I'm just going to grab it, move it around so it's more or less looking at my character. And if I ever want to see, you know, um, what the camera sees, so rather than looking kind of as a bird's eye view on the scene, you can look through your camera at any point by pressing the uh, toggle camera view button, which is over here on the right hand side. Um, if you have this menu open, it might be slightly, slightly over here. But the one that looks like a kind of old school uh, film reel, if you click that, it will take you to whatever the view is of your active camera. So in this case, I can see that I was pretty close, but I'm currently only uh, <laughs> only kind of seeing uh, my character or my beast's body, which is fine for now. So now we've got one camera in the scene. Uh, I'm just going to add, I'm just going to name this. So I'll just, maybe I'll name it camera one. You know, the next one I add might be camera two and then the next one camera three. I'll change my point light to light by one. You might have more than one. We're just going to leave it as one light in the scene at the moment, but so cameras, so the first thing to know about cameras is the orange bounding box, so the viewable area of the camera, will be the resolution that you set um, in your scene. So if you come over here to the right hand side, uh, amongst where you've got all the different tabs for various kind of render outputs and you've got your world and you've got collections and object data and all that sort of stuff, right down here, the little green camera icon. So again, the object data properties will take you into the properties of the camera. 
So in the properties of the camera, you can't actually control the sort of ratio of the viewable area of the camera. So that's controlled kind of slightly counterintuitively, but not so much in the output tab. So the third one down. So in the third one down, got the format of your scene. So the resolution. So the resolution in terms of the length of the x-axis camera. So the length of the horizontal and the length of the vertical, which is the y. So 1920 by 1080 tends to be like a relatively standard sort of horizontal format. Um, if you're looking at things for Instagram and things like that, you might want more of a square format. So you might want to make these equal. So 1920 by 1920. If you want a vertical format, you might want to reduce the resolution of the X. So you might want to go 1080. And you can see the camera is now kind of framing more of the vertical space around um, a character. And another thing to pay attention to, especially when you get into animation, and we'll get onto the timeline in a little bit, is the frame rate. So at the bottom of the format section, if this isn't, like you might have this um, not expanded, sorry. So if you expand the format section, and at the bottom here is the frame rate. So there'll be a bunch of different standards. Uh, I won't go into like the specifics of each standards, uh, each standard, not that I know uh, particularly the differences, but the common ones you might find are 24, 25, 30, and 60, and then 120, 240 maybe. <laughs> um, and this is the frame rate of your animation if you are setting up Blender to do animations. So 24, you can get away with 24 frames per second. Everything I've rendered so far up to this date in Blender with a Kickle Beast has always been 24. 24 is quite common in film. Um, not for any kind of like artistic reason, but more for just uh, no one's really changed the standard since it was quite expensive to manufacture film. If you go higher than 24 frames a second, so say you go to 30, it means you'll have 30 frames for every second that is played. So your render times might go up um, and you might not see a lot of visual smoothness between 24. And again, if you go to 60, your render times will increase again because you'll have to render more images or a larger sequence of images for any given video. So if you're looking for kind of like maybe the quickest um, or, you know, maybe your PC is not so good and you just want to get something out, 24 frames a second is usually like a really good uh, number to kind of stay at. Um, because it means for every one second of animation that you play, you're only rendering 24 images rather than 30 or rather than 60 rather than 120. Um, and if it rent if it takes you two minutes or even one minute to render, every one second it will take you 24 minutes, every one second it might take you half an hour, every one second it might take you an hour. You, you very quickly uh, end up into some really long render times. And relatively speaking, 24 frames a second looks quite filmic um, and everyone's kind of used to seeing uh, videos and film at 24 frames a second. So um, videos are just a sequence of images played really quickly. So you will have noticed this if you tried to like, if you've already tried to do, kind of do an animation or if you've imported a mixed mode character, for example, and it has a certain pose and you've scrolled over to kind of the, the point in the timeline that you like the look of the pose, and you've rendered out that still image. That's just a point in time. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, the rest of the functions that we need are for the cameras are in the camera section itself. So down here, the green camera icon. So there's a bunch of different options here for the lens. Um, I guess if you're like really into um, cameras, you'll almost certainly know more than me uh, when it comes to this. But the first box over here is the type of the camera that you set up. And there's only three, option, three options here. Um, probably the most that you'll use um, more commonly are the first two. So the first one is perspective. So that's, uh, I guess you could think of that as like normal life. Anytime you look through your eyes, you're th seeing things in perspective, as in there's a vanishing point in the distance and all the lines and all the objects get smaller the further they go into the distance. If you select orthographic, 
it doesn't matter how far away the objects are, they'll always be sort of the same scale. So orthographic might be a great way or like, is really useful if you want a perfectly front view of your character for some reason. Like maybe you're trying to make a silhouette for a logo or wh whatever it might be, and you want a perfectly uh, symmetrical, you want a perfectly flat um, view of your character in a way that you couldn't be able to see in your eyes or like in real life and you want to just create an outline in Illustrator or whatever program in Photoshop, you know, orthographic might be a really great option for you. But we're going to stay in perspective for now because it's the way that the camera see and also your eyes. Um, the next one down is the focal length. So um, this is useful if you want to create like slightly more stylized looks. So the further you or the higher you increase the focal length, the sort of flatter the image becomes. So in, in our case, it's also zooming in the camera. Um, but in effect, you can think of it as like the higher the focal length, the closer to orthographic it goes. And the lower the focal length, the more exaggerated the perspective. So the more exaggerated the fall off. Um, you'll see this, you'll see low focal lengths used quite a lot in maybe like uh, mu music videos or things like that where there's like a fisheye lens or whatever it might be maybe there's a camera really close to someone's face um yeah maybe there's a camera like really close up on someone's face and they're singing into a microphone or whatever it might be you you might see like a, a relatively low focal length view stare where everything feels a little bit distorted feels kind of cool and stylized um if you're like really into it there are like standards for focal length so there are like certain um numbers that cameras can uh more easily achieve or the lens of the cameras can more easily achieve um depending on the cost of the lens um but usually a good kind of ballpark to stay in is like i don't know if you were to put a figure on it somewhere between 30 and 80 like 50 tends to be a fairly like even a fairly good or 50 or 55 tends to be like a fairly standard focal length for cameras so it tends to look relatively natural you can push this all the way up to 80 if you if you wanted something a little bit flatter or all the way down to 30 if you wanted something a little bit more exaggerated whatever it might be and you'll have to change the kind of um you can see it obviously changed the sort of um i guess you would call it like the relative closeness of my character relative to the camera so you would just maybe zoom in a bit or like move the camera slightly closer to your character to kind of counteract that, but I digress. Um, and then you might not use much of the other ones. I think they're not so important. Depth of field could be quite useful. So if you turn on depth of field, you can um, have certain things in focus and certain things out of focus. So the first uh, box here is about focusing on an object. So you can pick any object you have in the scene in this box, or you can use this little eyedropper over here and you can select anything from your viewport. So I could select my uh, the head of my character. And then if you decrease the f-stop, if I was in anything, say I was in cycles, if I decrease the f-stop, you know, like, oh, actually also in EV, you can see here the edge of that backdrop ramp gets blurred. If I increase the f-stop, it comes back to sharp. So this is a good way of, um, and you can animate between the focus points. So you can see here that because my f-stop is like super low, so 0.1, you can see that I've selected the balaclava as the focus point. Um, so it's a really, if I increase this, it will take more or less of my kind of character's head into and out of focus. Um, I got a little bit, uh, a little bit involved there in the uh in the settings tab but anyway we can let's just say we're setting up something for um see meg's got some knowledge on uh on some film sizes there in the chat but i'm sure there are some like camera <laughs> camera enthusiasts that know way more than i could ever hope to know on lenses and things like that but um let's just say we're setting up an animation for instagram so we want it to be relatively vertical I'm going to use a sort of 50 mil lens, 50 millimeter lens, and I'm going to go from here. And the first thing to do is decide, let's say we want a sequence of camera movements. So let's say I want, uh, depending on the time I might have, or depending on the time of this tutorial, maybe I want three camera movements. 
So maybe I don't want 250 frames in terms of like an animation length. So you might not be able to see this um, this bar at the bottom that I'm kind of dragging up. But and if you don't see it, you can drag up. Um, you can drag up another window by coming over to the bottom left and you'll see a little crosshairs. Hopefully you can just about see there and you can drag up another window and over here in the top left of any window in Blender. So it doesn't have to be this window, but it could be this window up here, could be this window up here, this window up here. You can change any window you want at any point in Blender. So if you, that's what happens if you actually toggle across the windows at the top is all it's doing is just changing the uh, type of window and where the windows are at any one point to kind of blend as standards. But you can create any sort of custom layout of window that you want. So I'm going to drag up something from the bottom here and I'm going to go over here to the top left and I'm going to change the window type. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to go over one. So into the, oops, sorry, into the animation column. I'm going to go down here into timeline. And this will bring up a kind of uh, literally a timeline. So you'll see a bunch of numbers at the top. You'll see a blue um, marker that you can drag all the way across. If you press space or the um, buttons up here, you can play forward, you can play back, you can press pause. Space pauses and plays in the forward direction. You'll see that blue marker move left to right all the way to the end and then it will cycle back depending on the length of your timeline and you set the length of your timeline over here on the right hand side so start being frame one and end being frame 250 in this case and you could take that all the way up to a thousand however hundred a thousand however long your animation needs to be you'll have a timeline about as about as long as that but let's say I only want three really quick camera movements. I might only get to uh, do maybe two in this tutorial, but uh, let's say I want three. Maybe I want each of those camera movements to be two seconds long, for example. And this is where it's handy to just keep an, a mind on your frame rate that you've selected. So I've got 24 frames per second in this case. So for every second, there's 24 frames. So if I look at my blue tab here, 24 frames along, so about here, would be one second's worth of time. Another 24, so all the way up to 48, would be about another second, and so on and so forth. So maybe I only want two or three, two seconds each. So I want, I don't know, maybe around 120 frames. Uh, someone who's quicker and better at maths than me could probably tell me the exact amount, but let's just say I want 120 frames. So, <laughs> And the timeline is built in numbers and the numbers you set over here and the play time. So for every one second, in my case, if you've set it to 30 frames a second, then right about here would be one second's worth of time. 60 seconds would be two seconds worth of time. 90 seconds would be three seconds and so on. So this first camera, let's say I want, um, let's say I want a a kind of mid shot of my character. So now I need to move my camera and set it up for the first frame. So the initial image that the animation starts on. So there are a number of different ways of doing this. You could come over here, over on the right hand, on the right hand side, sorry, go to the object properties, so the orange box, and you could manually move the camera using the location, so the location of X, Y, and Z, or Z. And you could move it like that if you really wanted. So, you know, I could move it down. And maybe I frame that character. Um, if at any point you kind of click out of, you know, out of that camera view and you want to get back and you're a little bit lost, you can come over here to the toggle camera view. You can also do number pad zero if you're fortunate enough to have a number pad, but I currently don't have one. So I always have to click this thing. Um, so I could, you know, I could, I could position my camera using these controls and that would work. You know, that would work. Probably the quickest way and the most intuitive way for people is to select your camera. So always make sure you have your camera active. You'll know when, you're, when you have an active camera, when it's selected, 
when there's an orange outline around the camera view. So if I click out, you'll see it's kind of a dotted, dotted marching ants line. If you click the camera either in the viewport or you come over here and click the little camera icon, you'll see it goes orange. The quickest way to probably position a camera is to go over into the um, the kind of positioning options for the camera. So uh, right now, this might be how you see things. If you press N, so N for, I don't know, what's the, is it Nevada? I think it's Nevada. So N for Nevada. It will bring up this um, right-hand bar over this this bar over on the right-hand side. And you may or may not see some of these things. I have a few add-ons enabled. If you enable some add-ons, like some, some different things further along the line, you'll see them get added in probably into this menu. So right now I have like Blender Kit or Mixamo, uh, Rococo, a few other things that are useful for like rigging and animation of characters and things like that. You may only see the first kind of three or maybe the first four if you've installed Blender Kit, whatever it might be, but you'll, you'll definitely see item, tool and view. And the one we want is view. So the view is the third one down and it will bring up this menu. It might be collapsed for you. So if you expand the view and expand however many you want, Right now we only need the view. If you go down right the way to the bottom, and I'll just expand this so you can see the whole the whole name, but this second one down is camera to view. So if you tick that, you'll notice that the camera uh, goes, has this sort of like red dotted uh, line all the way around. So if you click that, what this will do is enable you to move your viewport. So move your view that you see and for that movement to affect the position of the camera. So now I can just move around my 3D scene and you'll see that my camera, so the orange box here, moves with me. So this is super useful because it means you can kind of position your character using shift and middle mouse click or rotate with middle mouse button, whatever it might be. You can position your scene and your character in the camera more deliberately. So and you can zoom in and it will also work. So you can go really far out or really far in. But let's just say, for example, I want a, a nice kind of mid framing of my character somewhat centrally, you know, let's just assume that I'm, I'm on Instagram and making a reel, whatever it might be. And say I'm happy with this composition. So I'm happy with the framing of my beast inside this camera. I can then just untick camera to view. And now if I move around my scene, my camera won't move. The camera will always stay in that position. And I can go back to the camera view at any point by pressing toggle to camera view. So great. And now we have this kind of, yeah, as Rez says, uh, if you always forget to uncheck the box though, you can end up in some trouble. So just make sure you, you untick it. Um, especially once you start playing through the timeline, it becomes even more problematic. So. It's easier to position your cameras, but uh, it can cause you a little bit of problems if you don't remember to tick it. So uh, always remember. So untick it. Right. So let's just say that this is the first frame and the first uh, or the start point of my camera. And let's just say I want this camera to slowly zoom in to my to my beast. Now there's a number of different ways to do this, and this is where the timeline comes in. So in order to do that, you'll need to tell Blender what position the camera starts from, and then what position the camera will end up in. So I can go over to frame, doesn't really matter, frame zero or one, doesn't matter. And if I go over to, and there, is, there are lots of different ways to control cameras, but the simplest one is to use the object uh, properties. So the orange uh, square, over here on the right hand side. But I need to tell Blender that this is the first point in my camera movement, so the first point of my animation. So I need to keyframe, so I need to tell Blender that this is an important moment um, to fix in time. And there are a number of different ways of doing this, but I need to tell Blender that this location, so the position of my camera in X, Y, and Z, so in 3D space, is this is the position that I want initially. So I'll go over here to the transform box, I'll look over to the location X, Y, and Z. And you can right-click any of these boxes. So you can right-click 
and you can insert a keyframe. Or in, so you can insert keyframes into a whole row. So if you right click or whole, yeah, whole row or whole, whole column, sorry. You can insert keyframes, it will add them into all three. Or you can right click and insert a single keyframe, in which case it will add it to only the location of the X axis. Or you can come over here and press this little um, dot and you'll notice that it turns to a diamond. And again, the box turns yellow. Or you can press I. Uh, you can press I in any, any menu, but if you press I, uh, likelihood is if you've not set up any kind of custom uh, shortcuts, it will enter into the insert keyframe menu and you can add a keyframe for whatever. So you'll see that there's not only location, there's also scale and rotation and a bunch of other things. So if we set I and add in location, you'll see it does the same thing as if I right clicked and added the keyframes over here in the right hand column. And you'll notice as we do that, if you're in the timeline, it adds these dots. And at the bottom here, if you expand, you, this might not be expanded for you, but because we got the camera selected, so yeah, so if we got the camera selected, you'll be able to see the action of the camera, you'll be able to see the transforms and the animations that you lay on top of that object. And if I click on any other object, so if I click on his glasses, for example, you will notice that there are no, there are no things to expand. There are also no dots along this timeline. So there's no animation kind of present for this object. But if I click back to my camera, expand it, you'll notice that the dots come back. So we've told Blender these these little points are keyframes. So these each or this these individual uh, little dots are called keyframes. We've told Blender that this is the first image that we want to see. And let's say that we want our uh, first movement to be two seconds long. So in my case, that would be 40 fr 48 frames. So I'll come over, I'll drag this little blue thing all the way up to 48. And now I need my camera to be in a different position. So I need to tell Blender, you know, what's the end point of this camera? So let's just say I want to zoom in to uh, my beast here. So again, I can just control this through the X, Y, and Z locations over here on the right hand side, if you're still within the object properties. So in our case, um, you know, we want to move the Y which will zoom in and out. So let's just say I want to move the Y a little bit closer. Maybe I want to move the X a little bit over so you can still kind of centrally frame um, my character. <laughs> and this is great. This is the end frame that I want at the two seconds time. But if I don't tell Blender that this is what it needs to be, then it won't save the information. So if I then do anything else, like rotate my scene, I move back in the timeline, and I go back through my camera view, you'll notice that nothing happens, nothing changes to the camera. But that's because we didn't tell Blender, we didn't confirm to Blender exactly what the end point of that initial movement should be. So I'll go back over to the 48 frames, I'll control the Y a little bit, I'll shuffle the X over, and now you'll see that these two boxes, rather than green, they've gone orange. And that's because the position or the number in these boxes has changed. So I need to tell Blender that this is the, I need to confirm to Blender that this is the change I want to make. So I can, again, I can press I, I can right click over here and insert keyframes, or I could tick the, um, the little dots over on the right hand side if you wanted. And you'll see that's added in a second set of keyframes at frame 48. And now if I play my scene, you'll see that Blender knows that it has to move from position one all the way to position two. So this is the first kind of method of controlling a camera, which is probably the most basic. Um, and it doesn't have to just be the X, Y, and Z locations. You know, let's just say I want to also I want the camera to slightly rotate as well. 
I could also do that. So I could come back over to frame one. I can keyframe by pressing I or right clicking and inserting keyframes. The rotation, so the X, Y, and Z rotation, you don't have to add them all if you're only rotating in one axis, but for the sake of kind of simplicity of this tutorial, we'll just do it uh, pressing I to insert the keyframe and do them all at the same time. We'll go over to frame 48. And let's just say we want to slightly rotate the Y. So we're going to rotate it 10, 15 degrees or something like that. You'll see the box has gone uh, kind of orangey rather than green. So Blender's telling me that the position has changed from the initial keyframe and I just need to add and tell Blender that there's a new keyframe here. So I'll right click, insert keyframes. So now if I play through the timeline using space, it's not only zooming, it's also rotating and it's looking pretty good. And uh, let's say we want to add in a second movement. We might not get on to the, <laughs> to the third movement because, uh, because of time, but let's say we want another camera in our scene that does a different thing. Well, what can we do? The first step is to add the second camera. Now you could also animate the position of the camera to kind of jump and uh, change it that way. So you don't actually need a second camera. There are like multiple ways of um, kind of moving cameras around in Blender, but sometimes it's helpful to just break up sequences, so break up movements. You'll see also here if I play the timeline that the camera is moving in and rotating at the same time. Um, let's say I want to add a second camera, so let me just shift right click to bring my 3D cursor over here so the camera isn't over here somewhere when I add it in. Shift A to bring up the add menu, camera, and I've got my camera here. So going to move it around. It's going to be a different kind of view. Maybe it's going to be further away, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm just going to name that camera. So I'm going to name that camera. And if I click over here, so the green camera icon in the outliner, that will make that camera the active camera. You can also click into the um, into the viewport to select active cameras, whatever whatever you want. Uh, sometimes I just find it easier to use the, the green cameras up here. So I'm going to select this camera. I'm going to go to the camera view. So number pad zero or this little reel over here. And I'm just going to look at, you know, what, what that looks like through here. And it's not quite exactly maybe what I want for my second camera movement. So I'm just going to come back over here to the uh, menu that lives under N for Nevada into view and camera view the second drop down here, just ticking camera to view. Then I'm just going to rotate it to something that I actually want my camera to kind of be positioned like. So let's say, I don't know, I want to, maybe I want to lower to the floor, a slightly more dramatic shot. Maybe I want this camera to slightly rotate around my beast. And maybe I want it to be slightly more zoomed out. So let's just say somewhere around here. I'll untick camera to view so that that locks the camera position. And now if I move out, you'll see that that second camera is in a slightly different position to the first camera. And if I play my timeline, there'll be no animation on this camera because we've not told Blender, you know, where to go to and from. So with this second camera, we're going to look at a slightly different way of controlling, um, controlling the movement of this camera. And we're going to go over here, so make sure the camera is selected and it's the active camera, either through selecting it in the viewport or selecting it up here with the green camera icon. And we're going to go one up from the green data camera objects to this kind of, I don't know what you would call it, it looks like a kind of <laughs> some cogs and a belt or something, but it's the constraints tab. And it will be blank, but up at the top here, you click that drop down menu, you'll see a bunch of different options for controlling cameras. And some of these are extremely useful. So um, you might want your camera to track. So your camera to always look at an object no matter where you move it. That would be the track to constraint. Or you might want your camera to move along a path. So you set up a, a curve or like a 
a line in your scene that you want your camera to move along, and that would be the follow path constraint. So there are a number of different options here that you can look at, and you can definitely find some amazing tutorials that, um, that can really help. But the first one we're going to look at is the track two constraint. So if you click track two, it will bring up this constraint. And you can think of these like modifiers, but for cameras. So if you've ever um, made a mesh, let's, let me just click my backdrop ramp, for example, and I go up to here to the little spanner underneath the object uh, properties is the modifiers panel. And then you can add a bunch of modifiers. So you can add a, uh, you know, a subdivision modifier or a solidify modifier, whatever it might be. You know. uh, if you've ever used modifiers, Constraints are exactly the same in the sense of they are additive. So one constraint will add on top of another. So I could tell Blender, for example, to move my camera along a path. And then I could also then tell it on top of that for that camera to track an object as it moves along the path. So any constraint that you add on top of each other will stack. So you can get to some really creative and involved camera movements that way. But we're just going to look at a simple basic track two for now. And you'll see it opens up this drop down box. And the first box is the most important. Uh, yeah, by quite a while, uh, quite a way. But the you can either click into the box and select a, uh, select any object in your scene. You can also, I don't know, start typing in whatever you want. So I could type in backdrop ramp and it would start narrowing down and filtering the selections. Or you can pick the eyedropper tool over here and you can select something. So I'm, for the sake of this tutorial, just going to select uh, the shirt of my beast. And not a lot has happened, but if I go into my camera view, you'll see that it's, if I delete this and redo it, you'll see that it's now tracking the shirt of my camera, which is kind of annoying because the origin point to my shirt is actually somewhere down here because of the model. If I changed the origin point of the shirt, it would probably move the camera up. There you go. So if you ever find that your object is not actually looking at the, oh sorry, your camera is not actually looking at the object you've kind of told it to look at, uh, it might be because uh, the origin point of that object is not actually anywhere near the or the kind of center of that object. So, you know, you can see here, if I click on my character's head, the origin point is down here near the feet. So if I told the camera to look at the head, it would be looking at this point here. So just, just in case you ever get lost with that. Um, so now it's looking at my shirt. And now I want to tell Blender to switch cameras on frame 48. So after it, goes through this movement all the way to two seconds. I need it to switch the cameras at that point to my second camera. And it's relatively easy to do this. You just scroll all the way over to the point at which you want it to switch. You make sure that you have your second camera, so the camera you want it to switch to, selected and active. And you come over here to your timeline, and you press Control B. And what this does is it actually creates a marker. So control M would make a, or M I think it is, so M makes a marker. You can also add a marker in the markers tab up here. And then control B binds a camera to the marker. So my second camera is now sort of bound to frame 48. But in order to get this to work, I'll need to bind my first camera to frame one. So I'll just come over Make sure my first camera is active. Uh, press Control B over here on the timeline, and you'll see it adds camera 001 bound to the first set of keyframes on frame one. So now if I play my animation, you'll see that in two seconds time, it switches camera. This is exactly what you want. And you can have as many switches, you can have as many cameras in a scene as you want, uh, obviously before it becomes like mildly impractical to even navigate the scene. But um, you can continue doing this for camera three, camera four, whatever it might be. Control B to bind a camera to a certain point in time. 
So cool, I've got my animation, it's playing, it's switching cameras. Maybe I want a slightly different movement for the second camera. So I'll come over, I'll make sure my second camera is active and I'll need to add in a new set of keyframes. So I'll need to tell Blender it needs to go from this position to this position. So again, I could come over to the object properties tab. I could definitely animate the position through, um, through these things again. But because I've got the constraint on it, so because I'm telling the camera to track the shirt of my beast, it's going to behave a little bit differently. So if I rotate my camera, uh, what do I do? I don't, know what, I don't know what sort of movement we want on the second camera, actually. But if I, I don't know, let's just say I, uh, I want to move my camera up. So it will move my camera up and down but it will also keep the shirt as the center point of the camera frame. So in effect, now your positional values for location, so you know, left, right, up, up and down, forwards and backwards, end up having rotation to them because Blender is trying to keep the object that you've told it to track in the view of the camera. So rather than a kind of rotational value, as in your camera moving around the character, you've almost got that for free because you're moving the camera left to right, but it's also kind of rotating the center point of the camera to make sure it keeps that character in the middle. So I could just keyframe again, the current position. So come over here to the location. I could right click and insert keyframes, or I could press, um, I and insert location keyframes, or I could come over here and press I and it will insert them on whatever you hover over, which is a nice quick way of getting keyframes into any of those values. Or you could press individual ones up here if you're only animating in one direction. So for example, I'm only going to be animating the X axis here. So I don't actually need to tell Blender exactly where the Y and Z are. So in my case, I'm only going to animate the location of the X. So I'm going to keyframe only the X axis by pressing this little dot over here on the right hand side or right clicking the box and pressing insert single keyframe. So the one underneath insert keyframes, so in inserting single keyframe. And you'll see that it's added the points on the timeline as you expect. And I'll move forward another two seconds. So I'll go from 48 frames to 96 frames. And I'll move the location. I'll tell Blender that actually I want the camera to end up somewhere over here. But I need to tell Blender that this is what I want. And I'm going to confirm it by right clicking and insert single keyframes. So now if I play through the whole timeline, I've got the first movement, the first camera zooming and rotating. It automatically switches to the second camera. And then the second camera's movement happens. But you will only ever see on the timeline if you only have one object selected. So if I have my first camera selected, I will only ever see the keyframes for that first camera. If I have my second camera selected, I will only ever see the frames for my second camera. If I have both of them selected, I will see all of the keyframes for all of the things I have selected. And I know the timeline can kind of look intimidating when it uh, puts all these dots uh, in front of you. Um, but really, you can kind of ignore the first few dots. You're only interested in the dot that actually is the property that you want to control. The rest of them are just kind of there to show you that the stuff kind of collapsed underneath this bigger heading. So, you know, for example, I've only got the X location animated on the second camera. On the first camera, I've actually got the uh, X, Y, and Z keyframed, even though I'm only actually really using one of them or one of those positions. And I've got X, Y, and Z in terms of rotation because I'm controlling the rotation of the camera. And you can keep going like this. So I won't, I, we have kind of arrived at the hour point, although we did start a little bit later. So let me know if um, you guys want to stop or if you want me to add in a kind of a third camera movement that maybe uses a slightly more intermediate um, step. If people want to stay for a little bit longer, it's, it's kind of up to you guys. Uh, yeah, let me know.
Keep rolling. I'm all good. Okay, right. We'll add in that third camera as I planned then. Okay, so we'll do exactly what we did before. We will add in a third camera. So I will, uh, my 3D cursor is over here. It could be over here. It could be wherever you want it to be. Shift A to bring up the add menu. Camera all the way down here. Adds in my third camera. Um, you know, you'll have to sort of think about, you know, what kind of camera moves you want to make. You don't have to copy what I'm doing. Uh, it can be whatever you feel like, whatever makes sense kind of compositionally for your character, your scene, uh, you know, even the pace. So, you know, it doesn't have to be two seconds long. It could be quicker. It could be one second, half second, whatever it might be. It kind of depends on the feeling of the, of the video that you want to create. So I will create this third camera. Uh, maybe I want it to be slightly higher. Maybe I want it to be... Maybe I want it to start looking over here or whatever, side view. And I will name this camera. I'll just name the camera 003. We got to get a view of the map on the back. Oh, you got to get a view of the map on the back. All right, OK. Let's uh, <laughs> move that camera then. <laughs> um, yeah, credit to Mr. Cat on the uh, on the details of that. Or whoever modeled them, I'm not actually sure. Um, go to my active view let's see close close and again it's sometimes just easier to position your camera rather than kind of like freeforming it through the scene to just do the camera to view and, and move it more naturally um there we go all right so we've got the map on the back we've got the we've got the <laughs> we've got the uh we've also got um i don't know i may guess no one's seen this before but we've got some kind of lord of the rings style uh <laughs> like Elven or like some old map oh, uh, wow, that's la right. language on the back of that. And we've got um, a bit of South America by the looks of it and Africa on this one. <laughs> um, cool. So let's just say our third camera starts there or whatever. And I'll just untip camera to view. Uh, kudos to Mr. Cat on the, uh, on the details for that one. Can't take any credit on that. Um, so we've got camera three. Now let's just say we want to control, let's say we want to build on the knowledge of the first two cameras. So in the first camera, we had the movement of the camera. The second camera, we told the camera to look at this point. You'll also see, uh, you'll be able to see a relationship line. So you'll be able to see that camera two is kind of looking and is uh, tracking the middle point of my shirt here. If you don't see the relationship line, it's probably because you have an option hidden. hidden. So if you go, up here to the uh, viewport overlays toggle and it's the drop down box up here uh, there's a bunch of stuff in here you can hide whether or not you see the floor grid uh, you can hide whether or not you see the 3d cursor some of these are kind of useful if you're feeling a little bit uh, disoriented with the amount of kind of lines and information on them and then one down here in objects is relationship lines so if you turn that on or off you'll be able to see that this camera is tracking this. You'll also see these lines if you parent one object to another thing. So like if I parented, I don't know, the head of my character to this floor plane with control P, you would be able to see a line that went from the head uh, or the legs to this floor, whatever it might be. Anyway, bit of a uh, bit of a segue on that one. So we'll go back to camera three. Uh, let's just say we want to make this camera follow a path. So I want to tell Blender that I want this camera to sweep around the back of my character whilst also tracking a point on my character. So we can kind of use exactly the same logic that we used for the first two cameras, only we're going to try a different constraint this time. So we're going to go back over here to the constraints tab. So one up from the camera data object properties and make sure you have your third camera active. We are going to go for constraints, add object constraints. And we're going to go for over here in the fourth column on the right, follow path. And nothing will happen because we have no path for this camera to follow. But you'll see much in the same way that the track to camera constraint of our second camera you'll see in the same way, we've got the same drop-down box for the target for the path. So now we just need a path, like we need a path that this camera follows along. So 
In order to do that, we'll add in that path. So Shift A to add. And right towards the top underneath mesh is curve. So in curve, there's a bunch of options at the top. Uh, we won't go into the ones towards the bottom, but um, probably the more common ones you'll use are Bezier, NURBS or Path. It doesn't really matter which, um, which one you select. It doesn't have much of a bearing on the actual like uh, animation itself. Um, but some people prefer to control the paths or the, the splines, the curves along the path in slightly different ways. Like some people just have different preferences. But for now, I'll just select path because it sort of makes sense. Um, and you'll see, depending on where your 3D cursor is, like mine's just down here, it's added in this, this line and it's added in here in the outline of this NURBS path. Uh, and you can move this in the same way that you move any object, so G will grab it and move it around, so G, Z, whatever it might be, S will scale the path, you know, whatever it might be, and you can tab in to edit mode on the path. And if you tab into edit mode on the path, you'll see that uh, it's got a bunch of points along this path. Uh, if you tab in, I think the first time you tab in, if you have it selected, it will select all the points, but um, if you deselect them, you'll see that there's four points along this path. And right now the path is in a straight line. So if I just go up to the gimbal here at the top and I just press the Z axis, um, it will look straight down onto this path. <clears throat> Sorry. And we can then manipulate these points. So each one of these points is a vertex, much in the same way that if you're in a mesh, if I'm looking at my backdrop ramp and I'm in edit mode for my backdrop ramp, I can select any one of the corners or any one of these points and move them. A path is the same. So each one of these points is a vertex. So if I go back up into my Z axis, just because it's a little bit easier to see maybe, I can select these points and I can press G and grab them. And you see what that does is it starts making this, what was a straight line, now a curve. I grab this one over here, it's now an even more, more of a curve. If I grab these, I can start shaping them. And now I've got this arc. <coughs> Sorry. I've got this arc. And you can add to this curve. So if I select one of the endpoints, I can press E to extrude, and I can extrude another point. So I could keep going with this path, you know, like I could keep pressing E. I could make this path <laughs> as elaborate as I wanted, um, though. Um, it might be difficult to control, but you know, I can, you know, you can do whatever. And I'm only in the top, top view right now. So all of those movements that I've made have only made them in 2D space in the sense that I've only moved them kind of in this direction. So in the Y axis, but these points can be moved in 3D space. So I can select any one of these things and I can move them down. I could move them up whatever it might be, I can move them out. And now you'll see that the path takes on a completely different feeling. So you might want to, you might want a camera to go up and around an object, as well as like moving around something that is tracking, you know, whatever it might be, you might need to plan out exactly kind of what's, um, you know, what the flow of the camera is through your scene, whether that's just a pure rotation, whether it's a little bit um, kind of bumpy, you know, maybe you're animating the point of view of your character. So you're you're animating a camera as if you were seeing it through the eyes of your beast. You might want it to look a little bit unsteady. You might want it to kind of wiggle side to side as if he was walking or whatever it might be. But for now, let's just leave it like that. I've got this curve, it's moving up. It's moving also around in 3D space. And I need to tell Blender that I want this camera to attach to this curve. And this is where the follow path constraint that we added in um, earlier comes into play. So again, similar, how, similar to how we tracked it, we can press the eyedropper tool and we can pick either through the viewport, the NURBS path, we could pick it up here in the outline and we could also type it in here if you wanted, whatever you, whatever you want. And we'll click it. And you'll see that the camera kind of moves um, and it's sort of looked like it's moved and the relationship line is also pointing to the start of the path. Uh, but it's not 
at the start of the path. And this is because we'd already kind of assigned positional data to the camera, as in like the camera was already kind of positioned in 3D space uh, and it's just kept the relationship between the position that we had it originally and this path. And if you want it to attach exactly to the end of this path, you just have to remove the original positional data from this camera by pressing Alt and G. So Alt and G. And that will move the center point of the camera exactly and snap it to the exact point, start point of the path. So now we've got this camera. And how do we animate it along this path? Well, we'll go over to our, uh, you know, wherever the end of our second uh, camera position was. I think it was frame 96 or whatever. And we'll just tell Blender that we want this third camera to be. Uh, that we want it to camera switch at this point. So we'll just make sure we have the third camera active. We'll come down here over into the timeline, we'll press Control B, and it will add in that marker that tells Blender at frame 96 or whatever it was, it will switch cameras, which it does. Um, I'll just increase the end frame point so it just plays on for a little bit longer. Um, this is great, but it's not looking where we need it to, and it's not moving along the path. So we'll go over to frame 96, because this will be where we want the camera to start on the path. And we'll make sure we have the camera selected. We'll go over to the constraints tab, into the follow path thing, and the control that we want to animate. So the timeline is used for anything in Blender, so not just cameras, so the position of meshes, whatever it might be. Um, if you've ever imported an animation into Mixamo, you'll see loads of keyframes and crazy stuff going on in the timeline. It's because at each one of the control points for the bone of your character, if you're using a T-pose, um, it's animating, you know, up, down, left, right, X, Y, and Z, the rotational values of the wrist, the legs, the hands, the fingers, whatever it might be. So you'll see loads and loads of keyframes if you ever import an animation into Blender from Mixmo, for example. So the property that we want to actually animate to tell Blender to move along this path is the first one. So the, or sorry, the second, second one down, which is the offset. So zero being the very start of the path. And in this case, our path is kind of going backwards, but it doesn't really matter. And if we go all the way over to the right hand side, you'll see at minus 100 will be the very end point of the path. So we can tell Blender to go from zero to minus 100 at the second point of our keyframe. So the first keyframe we need to make is at zero. So I'll come over here to the offset panel. I'll either press this little button, uh, whatever it might be. Um, or you can press I, or you can right click, doesn't really matter. And then I'll tell Blender that at frame 100, I don't know, let's just go to the end. 150, I want it to end at this point on the path. So over here in the offset box, I'll type minus 100. It's gone orange to tell me that the position or the number has changed. And I just need to confirm with Blender that I want this position at this time. So at 150 frames, I want it to be at minus 100 offset. So I just press I to keyframe that, or again, the dot, or right click, whatever it might be. And now you'll see if we play the timeline, you'll also see the other cameras move because I'm not looking through the camera. But from frame 100 to 150, the third camera moves along, sweeps along this path from beginning to end. So now if I look through this camera, so toggle the camera view, it switches me and you can see <laughs> got some crazy, uh, Actually, kind of cool. Um, kind of whip over and around my beast. And we can combine exactly what we did for the second camera on top of this. So, this is what I mean about adding constraints on top of constraints in the same way that you add one modifier onto another. You might add a solidify modifier onto a subdivision modifier. You can add the follow path modifier, and then you can tell Blender that you want to track an object track two so tell the camera that at any point along this path you can track whatever you want in your scene so in my case i uh you know i might want to track my beast that's definitely an option you can track uh, your glasses or your head or whatever it might be but sometimes you get a little bit more flexibility by tracking something that isn't your beast so uh, if we shift a to add an object 
and about halfway down it will say empty and there are a bunch of empties and it doesn't really matter which one you pick but an empty is essentially what it says on the tin i'm just going to add in the arrows for now because it's kind of it's like relatively straightforward it tells you which way is x which way is z and which way is uh, y and an empty object is exactly what it says on the tin it is literally something that exists in the scene but will never show up in a render has no real property is not a mesh um it's just it exists purely as a function to tie other things to it so you can pair an anything to an empty you can tell a camera to track an empty you can um i could you know for example i could take my beast head i could um click it i could shift click my um empty i could press Control p to parent it and now whatever i did to the empty would happen to my beast head so if i rotated my empty the beast head would also move. Um, that's not a particularly useful example, but it's an example nonetheless. <laughs> um, so an empty object is just the, it's a thing that won't appear in any of your renders, but it's really useful to tie other things to it. So in our instance, we can tell Blender, I'll move, I'll move this um, empty all the way over here to my character. Maybe I'll position it just around where his head is. And then we can tell Blender to track this empty. So we don't have to track the position of my character. I can track the position of the empty. So imagine your character was a T-pose and you had this guy, you know, had your beast walking. You might not want the camera to um, track the head of your beast as it moved or walked away from the camera. You might want it to track somewhere else and for your beast to kind of depart the scene or depart the camera view, whatever it might be. So empty is a really useful, flexible way of um adding in another layer of detail onto your kind of movements for cameras so i'll go back to my third camera i'll tell it to track to this empty over here in the outliner and you'll see the camera jumps from looking somewhere down here to looking over here to the empty and you'll see the relationship line that blue line and from the center of the camera to the empty and you'll see if i move the empty through g it will move the camera wherever i want so now if I look, if I go back to my timeline and I play through the view of my camera, you'll see that when it switches to the third camera, it will track my character whilst also moving along the path. So, and this isn't, this is now no longer tied to the position of the character. So for example, say I just don't like the composition, so I don't like the way that my beast is set up in this frame, I can just move the empty rather than move the camera. And that will control the look point of this camera. So maybe I say that I want to frame somewhere here rather than where it was. I could also then, um, I could also animate this empty. So I could take this empty and I could tell Blender that at frame 96, I want it in this position. So again, how we animated the very first camera, go over to the object properties, keyframe in the locations through I, right clicking or pressing the dots, scroll over to 150, and I want my empty to be, for some reason, uh, looking down at his feet. I'm, you know, I'm not really sure why. And then I'll tell Blender to press I to keyframe that position, that second position. Now that empty will move at the same time as my camera is moving along a path at the same time as I'm tracking the object. So it's a way of the empty becomes a really nice way of just layering in another level of control if you need it. Um, you can then also, I think someone's just said zoom in on the map. Um, you can zoom in on that camera. So your camera is another set of animation data that you can add. So at the moment, all we've told Blender to do is add, um, is to tell it to go from 0 0.0 to 100 on that path. But we've not told it to zoom in or not zoom in or zoom out or whatever it might be, but we could also add this. So we could make sure our third camera is active. We could keyframe, um, no, we could keyframe, I don't know, what could we keep from? The x-axis, which will zoom in and tell Blender, okay, I want keyframes here 
And for some reason, I'm going to zoom in very intensely on his feet. Um, I'm not saying you should do this. This is not particularly great compositional advice, but and then I keyframe that. Now I've got four levels of control on this very final camera. So make it easier to replay that. So now I'm telling the camera to move along the path, track an empty that's also moving whilst also zooming in the camera. So you can see you can get with very few objects in the scene. We've only got three objects and a couple of constraints. You can make the cameras do whatever you want, whatever you dream up of. So that last section was a little bit more intermediate, but the first two sections were hopefully um, quite clear. Um, the first one being just a very basic zoom and a rotation animation. The second one being tracking your character or your object and whilst moving left to right, which gives it a little bit of a rotational kind of appearance. There are other ways of getting rotations in cameras, but um, the track two constraint is really useful. And then the third one is kind of a build on the first two, where you can then add even more complex movements to your character or to animate your scene in any way that makes sense. So that's the end. <laughs> so hopefully uh, that's been useful. Hopefully um, it wasn't too confusing until the end. If anyone has any questions, like just shoot them in the chat. Uh, alternatively, if you, if you need to just, if you need to get back to work or whatever, uh, I'm not quite sure what time zones people are in, you can always um, shoot me a DM and I'll try and answer your questions there. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>